Okay. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mullen, the it's six o three, so and the board is present. So if you want to start the meeting, you can start it at any time. Oh, yeah, Kathy, we I have I, I have it all written down here. Hang on. Hmm. We have one, two, three, four. Any other additionals? So I have four plus one. I have a total of five people wanting to address the board. Sir. So I'm going to call this board meeting to order at 6.04. Uh, I'm going to do a roll call vote just to make sure all of our board members are present. Palmer Mullen is here. Victoria Cornell. Virginia Lawson. Here. Jose Tapia. Here. Alma Rio. Here. Now I'm going to welcome our guests. Welcome to the meeting of the Fairfax Elementary School District Board of Trustees. This meeting is held in compliance with the state of California and County of Kern Sunshine Law. We have a place on the agenda to hear from members of the public who attend our meeting. And it is good if you can call the superintendent before the meeting and have a place on the agenda for any issue you want to talk about. However, if you haven't done that, you must fill out a form provided for you and give it to the board before the meeting begins. Each item on the agenda can be discussed by members of the public. 20 minutes are provided for each agenda item. Several people can speak during these 20 minutes. We do hope that you, we do hope that you refrain from visiting while in attendance and the meeting <coughs> as this can be disconcerting to the board members. Thank you for being here. So we, okay, we are going into public comment. That's correct. Mr. Mullen, we do have people wanting to address the board tonight. So um, if you are wanting to read that statement, you can read that statement. Okay, we do have some public comments. So I do have a statement to read. A person wishing to be heard by the board shall first be recognized by the president and then shall proceed to, com to comment as briefly as the subject permits. Individual speakers shall be allowed no more than three minutes to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item. The board president shall not permit any disturbance or willful interruption of board meeting. Persistent disruption by individuals can be grounds for the president to terminate the privilege of addressing the board. The board may remove a disruptive individual. Individuals who may disrupt a board meeting may be guilty of violating California Penal Code 403, a misdemeanor. Who do we have first? Okay. Tonight, uh, requesting to speak to the board was uh, Mr. Overbeck. Ms. Overbeck, Mr. Overbeck. Mr. Overbeck, yes, sir. Um, was recognized by the president. Hello, everyone. Thank you for hearing me speak today. Uh, my name is Michael Overbeck. I have five students within the Zephyr Lane District, uh, or I'm sorry, the Fairfax District. I have four at Zephyr Lane Elementary School and one at Fairfax Junior High School. Uh, I am coming here to address the board as I've had a major concern over the last year over the nutrition that's being provided for our children. Uh, we have noticed over the uh, before COVID and then obviously after COVID with the meals being sent home, there has been a steady decline in the quality and nutritional content being provided to the children. Uh, I have reached out to Mr. Andrews several times regarding my concern and his uh, response was, oh, it meets the nutritional guidelines for the state of California. Um, we have had experiences with sour milk, expired food, rotten vegetables, rotten fruit, uh, you name it, and it's come home, busted bags, uh, you know, seals that are not properly sealed, 
Uh, it has just been a continual ongoing thing. I've had conversations with uh, both the assistant superintendent and Mr. Coleman himself regarding this issue. And I thought it was about time that a parent came up and stepped up and, and addressed the issue. Uh, I, I just think that meeting the minimum nutritional guidelines for our children is an unacceptable guideline or standard. And I think we should be going above and beyond, especially in these times where a lot of families may or may not have uh, enough food on the table because of, of the, the COVID pandemic. You know, it, it's something that I've seen as a real issue. Some of my neighbors are affected of it. I've seen some of my children's friends that are affected of it. Uh, and I just think that we should be trying to do better instead of just meeting the basic needs. Uh, we've also noticed that comparative to other school districts, our, our uh, nutritional standards are really lacking. Uh, you know, other schools are serving hot food to their students to take home to eat where we're just giving them prepackaged stuff that sometimes doesn't even seem edible. You know, my children have brought home grilled cheese sandwiches with six slices of cheese and they were so greasy that you literally had to like take a napkin to dampen them off. So I, I, I didn't know what the next step was. Obviously I tried to go through the hierarchy. I talked to school principals, I talked to you know superintendent. So I wanted to address the board here to see if there was something that we could do to come up with some kind of a solution to do better. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Obeck. Um, to on uh, Mrs. Rolls had requested a um, an address to board. Let me see if she is online here. <clears throat> okay, Patsy, are are you there? I am here, Mr. Coleman. Okay, Patsy Rolls is recognized by the president to speak before the. Uh, attendees all right so patsy you're um you're good to go here let me turn up the speaker here are you good can you we can hear you go ahead thank you uh mr coleman and mr molan i want you all to know about your situation in your district regarding your superintendent and your board members this is not a problem with your superintendent it is with your own problems that you have in yourselves. I want you all to know it is not you personally, the community is unhappy with. It is your actions that have caused the situation to develop. You didn't follow board policy when you chose not to agree with the investigative reports. Mr. Mullen has not denied his actions. It is a slap in the face to your staff. And fortunately, you listened to him and you did not listen to your board policies. If it is so difficult for you to do this, you, how are you gonna feel when you have an expulsion hearing against a neighbor's child? You're not going to be able to do it because you're not gonna be able to follow your board policies. To end the situation, all you need to do is agree with the with the investigative report and censure Mr. Molan. Mr. Molan, if you would have agreed to the terms of the disciplinary disciplinary action, which is fair, and during this year learn your role as a trustee, this would not be happening. Hiring the legal firm to challenge the censure was uncalled for. Now to to the financial action taken to hide the cost of the taxpayer money is appalling. The, the Kern County Superintendent of Schools has used a precedent to hide these fees. I think it is only fair then fees be reported. This is the student's money, not yours. And maybe it can go more to the cafeteria if you stop this business of trying to hurt each other. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, let me see here. Okay. Uh, next here. Sorry. Hang on there. Uh, Pam Padilla. Uh, Pam Padilla is recognized by the president to speak before the board. This time we'll use the microphone. 
Um, as you guys know, I came before you last month to uh, represent people within the community, the ones that want me to represent them. Um, not only are the community, the adult community members of this community concerned about your guys' actions, but the children of the Fairfax District are not ignorant at all. A lot of them are aware of the turmoil happening here in our own district. There are two behavior models that the students follow here at Fairfax. The first is SOAR, and the second is the three R's. SOAR stands to show respect, be on task, act responsibly, and reach for personal best. How are we supposed to enforce these principles to our kids when the people who are making big decisions for them are not modeling their behaviors we teach? The three R's stand for respect yourself, respect others, and respect your school. There are members of the board who are making decisions that are not respectful to our school staff and students. There are funds being redirected away from our students and their benefit. If we keep allowing these selfish decisions, how will we lead our students by example? How can we preach Fairfax pride when there is malice and selfish people leading our district? The Fairfax pride board expectations that are right outside, or the student expectations that are right outside can apply to the board as well. S means to show respect, not harass coworkers, and not exclude the community. O means to be on, on task, not redirecting student funds for personal use and not making the student second priority. A means act responsibly, not, not follow selfish impulses and not pass the blame. And R means reach for a personal best, not stand aside to save your reputation and not make excuses, which you guys have all done. Several times I have come to this board with, astound with astounding messages from our community. As a representative, we have taken action to bring awareness to the community expressing that we would like for you, Mr. Mullen, Mr. Tapia, and Mrs. Rios to resign for the betterment of our district and our children. Recently, we had signs placed in several neighborhoods that displayed the price for the community. It has been brought to my attention that the Fairfax School District is being blamed for the placement of these road signs. Those signs were paid for with donations from people who want this change to happen. The fact that someone took it upon themselves to remove these signs proves to the community that they had truth to the words printed on them. Regardless of the actions to silence the voices of the community, our efforts will not cease. We will not be silenced. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... Yes, uh, Jeff Chrysler. Jeff Chrysler. Actually, it is. No. <clears throat> My name is Jeff Chrysler. My family and I have lived in Fairfax School District for 20 years. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Jeff Chrysler, you're recognized by the president to speak before the attendee. Okay, thank you. My name is Jeff Crystal. My family and I have lived in the Fairfax School District for 20 years. All three of my children have gone through the district over the years. We have seen too many schools built, but today we've seen one of the oldest districts in the state be torn apart by a wicked, self centered small group of horrible humans, and it's just awful. That these board members, small and tapia areas, are going to destroy what they are supposed to secure and represent, not for themselves, but for the students and the faculty, is sad and at most a travesty. I do not understand they can look themselves in the mirror, much less go out in public. Part of the problem is the lack of knowledge of these current events that have taken place in recent weeks. That is an issue that is being corrected as we meet here tonight. And this man's hearing it for the first time. To be paying tax dollars that go to a corrupt and out of control school board is something that many residents of the district will not accept. It is obvious that Mola and Tapia and Rios have no interest in the best interest of the district, but instead only themselves. Trips for training in and out of state, paying to have your employment record sealed, using legal counsel from a, part, a firm hired outside of the one that the district has already on retainer. The question is, what are you hiding? The evidence from the independent investigator report should be grounds for your removal. I'm going to do something that some people aren't going to agree with. Mr. Mullen, uh, doing a little homework. Uh, divorce in 2009 with visitation with the exchange occurring at VPD. In 2011, that visitation was revoked with the restraining order filed. This is, this is, you are, you can dissent, but you cannot attack. So 
Uh, if you feel like you need to attack, I'm going to have to. I'm not attacking. I'm saying you right. can dissent. That is fine. You may dissent, but you may not attack a personal board member. Then I'll continue. The level of intelligent and good moral standards one they should have, which Mr. Mullen, Rios, and Tapios are displaying that they do not possess, is much, very much needed by those here tonight. For the three to continue to go down this path of mismanagement of public funds is laughable, and there is no rational, level headed person who thinks that these actions are acceptable. To know that you're receiving 100% health care paid for by the district is disgusting. If that number is two twenty thousand dollars a year times three, that's sixty thousand dollars a year that I know could be used by the district in much better ways. So, we'll go ahead and skip that page. My words have been somewhat tame. My opinion, and it's my opinion, is, is my own. It's mine that Mr. Mullen is untrustworthy, deplorable. Your conduct and actions speak volumes. For Rios and Tapia, why do you continue to sink into the cesspool? Public service is just that, serving those who elected you and deserve a dignity, respect, and honesty. Let me repeat, that dignity, respect, and honesty. Save the district as soon as the staff, the taxpayer, the time, money, and heartburn and walk away tonight, right now. Why continue to put the stress on yourself and your family? Each day that you remain, you will have to hide deeper and deeper in the webs of lies and deception you have created for yourself. You will be best judged by the best thing you ever did. And you can do that tonight, right here, right now, by resigning. Mullen, Tappy, and Rios, you're wolves hiding in sheep clothing, taking advantage of the sheep. Some may not understand that comment, but know that I am a sheep dog. Um, yeah. Okay, we have um, Kathy Adams. Hi, Kathy, you uh, are recognized by the president to speak before the attendees. Are you ready for me? Yes. Oh, well, again, good day to everyone who attended this evening. I'm Kathy Adams, Kathy Adams. I worked here before, volunteer. I've been here for quite a while. But this is not the reason why I'm here. The reason why I'm here is that I've been on the board before. We have had a great variety of board members, from teachers to people that are great with um, the bylaws, which is Hector Road. Accounting, which goes to Bobby, um, people that you probably haven't known. And we had, it was a great combination of people with Heritage and Morgan. And my mentors were, were a great combination. My mentors were Robert Alvarado and Javier Morgan. They taught me how to fight for children's education and nothing more. They were such great men to me that they looked up, that I looked up to them. Since I ran from the board members, I ran every year. I ain't gonna lie. I was not gonna lay down and let this all go. I ran every year, even though I was gonna lose, I did. But I noticed the year before, my posters have been going, they've been thrown on the ground. And then this year, I put like over 2,000 boards and somebody stole them. Here they were on the ground, didn't spit on them, don't nothing, took them and stole them. $2,000. How can that be? And what I've seen is they were trying to corner the market. Because all you see was Virginia, not no blame. Virginia, Javier, your names were everywhere. But mine and other people were down. I think, you know, no one's giving him a chance. Who's say, Bernie, I pushed him to do this. He goes, 
to uh, allow you three extra additional minutes. Can I get a motion? Can I get a motion? I thought we had wonderful people working here together. Se second. No. Second, second motion. Okay, uh, Virginia, Virginia Lawson. For her to go forward. For a vote. Mm -hmm. For her to go forward. Alma Rio. Yes. Palmer Moline, yes. Victoria Cornell. No, sir. No. Jose Tapia. Other Jose Tapia. Okay, that is a 4 1. You may continue three additional minutes. I have great people to look up to. Those signs are degrading. What kind of neighborhood are we? We're supposed to be teaching our kids. We are not teaching our kids anything good. Putting posters, doing all this negative stuff. We're supposed to be our kids teaching them something, and we are not teaching them anything good by doing this stuff. You can laugh at it all you want, but it has to start with the board. No, what I have to start with is a good day. Superintendent, all that, but everything you guys are saying, it leads up to it's him. How can we oh, yeah, have yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm an outside third party, but this doesn't seem like it's a very no, you're not. You live in the district, you have kids. I live in the district, what do you have? I asked yeah. them all, but we're but but addressing the board on each other, we're going to shut down. If we're going to continue, I'm going to have to adjourn. All I'm just trying to say, I've been here for 40 years. I'm doing that in my community. I've been working at Shirley Lane for over 12 years. Now I'm in there one If your kids need help or anything, we get out, you know, um, fellowship. We'll help you get your kids out of fellowship. I'm in that post, but that's yeah. not it. The thing Three is, minutes. the main person who is. Time's up. Okay. They are his boss. He's your boss. Oh, oh yeah, wait. Uh, then we have Maritza Pineda. Marissa Pineda. Marissa Pineda, you're recognized by the board. Thank you. President. Um, I agree with her in the fact that she was saying about the posters, you know, that her was put down and all that. So I did notice that the ones at the other committees been putting up for the recognition of Mr. Moeller, Mr. Tapia, and Ms. Rio have been coming down too. It's money that was wasted, it is wasted because we're trying to put a, a message out there. And I'm including myself because as hard as this is, I've worked with Mr. Molin, I've worked with Ms. Rios, and um, they portray themselves to be a certain person, and now they're, they're showing a different person. It, it hurts, it's sad because as a parent, you know, a former migrant parent, I thought that we were gonna have so much for this district. My kids were gonna have so much, bringing so much stuff to this district, not waste the money in stuff that is not needed. You know, there's other kids out there that don't have that help at home. The migrant students, Mr. Tapia, Ms. Rios, they're migrant parents. They know what I'm talking about. There's kids out there that don't have that extra help at home. The school's trying to provide that for them, not only through the migrant program, 
through their other programs as well. And to see that they're using this fund, they're misusing the funds that can go to these kids. We're in a pandemic, we're almost going out of it because the kids are back in school. There's some kids that are still waiting to come back to school. And you don't know how these kids are gonna be mentally. You don't know what kind of help they're gonna need when they go back. You don't know what psychological or what kind of stuff they've gone through at home. And it's sad to know that they might not have, the district might not have the funds to give those kids that help. Not only the kids, the parents. I'm here for my kids and all those kids in the district because I've worked with them. I worked with the teachers, with our, our principal in Virginia, with Mr. Coleman. I've worked with everybody in the parent center. And I know that this district has so much to offer our kids in our community. And I believe that in order for this to happen, we do need to have Mr. Tapia, Mr. Mullen, and Ms. Rio resign and have somebody else put their position that will help our students. That it, that they have the best interest of our students, not there. And I hope that, I really wanted us to have a compound meeting so that we can address this in that town hall meeting. Unfortunately, Mr. Mullen didn't want us to have that meeting, and that's why I'm here. I had to get a babysitter to take care of my kids so I don't have to bring them here. I try to show my kids of what's going on, and they come home and they say, Mom, did you hear this? Did you hear that? Did you see this side? Have you seen that side? Have you heard about this? And it's sad to tell your kids. The statement is that. Would you like some extra time to finish your statement? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. And that is all of the public comment for tonight, Mr. Mullen. Thank you for all your public comments. We will now move into the. May I ask one question before we proceed? Has anybody requested a third party financial audit of the board spending? We want to. We. Go ahead. You, we did last. Every year, the district's books, including the functions related to the board, are audited by an independent auditor. And, and that was done this last year? Yes, every year. And where can those records be done? The district audit, I believe, is on the website. Mr. Medina, on the website? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If you want help with that, uh, you kind of come sign deciphering it. You can get it. Give me a call. We'll take care of it. Appreciate it. Um, we. You didn't forget to do that, right, sir. Yeah, we can do that right now. Absolutely. Okay, sure. we're gonna go, we, uh, we made a boo boo. We made a mistake. We're going to go ahead and salute the flag. Um, so <laughs> you guys want to off and just. We made a boo boo. <laughs> salute pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Mullen, we also should approve the agenda in the minutes for the last meeting. Um, I would like the approval for the agenda and the approval of the minutes for February 11. Do I have a motion? Motion. I shall move. All second. Okay, y'all the first from Virginia, second from Victoria. Um, can I get a vote? Uh, Ms. Rios? Oh, aye. Ms. Lawson? Aye. Palmer? Aye. Victoria? Aye. Jose? Aye. Okay, that's the approval of the agenda and approval of the minutes. With that, we're going to move into the recognition section. Yes, and thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, every every month the the uh, board tries to recognize uh, one of our employees who uh, goes above and beyond consistently on behalf of the students and uh, and her peers. 
Uh, these, oftentimes this award is uh, nominated by her peer or the peer of, of who's being recognized and or uh, that site's um, uh, administrator. This month, we would like to recognize Renee Johnson from Shirley Lane Elementary. Renee is uh, un unfortunately, uh, like many in today's times, having to um, find herself sitting at home for a few days while things clear up. So um, Dave, are you, where are you, Dave? Would you like to, I know she's online here. Uh, would you like to speak nicely uh, without <laughs> Renee here, but at least she can hear you? It would, it would be very easy to speak nicely. I've got to say Renee is our top coach at Trillian Elementary. She does an absolutely phenomenal job, extremely dedicated, puts in a tremendous amount of hours. She's always there early, stays late, does a fantastic job um, working with our, our students with reading intervention, as well as uh, coaching our EL students, getting ready for the LPAC, coordinating all the testing at, at, um, for True Lane's LPAC testing. And even in this day where we're doing things remotely and with distance learners, we're way ahead of schedule with LPAC testing this year. She's done a phenomenal job organizing, getting that done. Um, she serves in many capacities, helping out with our booster club, with our carnival, all kinds of different events. She's also our athletic director for Shirley Elementary, has been coached numerous sports in the past. Uh, when, when coach can't be at a, at a day, she steps right in. She can coach any sport. I mean, just each and every day, she's a Shirley through and through, has a heart of gold, loves the kids at Shirley Lane, loves the kids at Fairfax, and just does a tremendous job. It makes my job a lot easier too along the way because she's always there lending a hand wherever it could be. And I can't thank Renee enough. It's very deserving. She's a very much deserving of the power of the award. Will you take this on her behalf? And thank you, Mr. Mack, for accepting that. We appreciate it. We will move into the E, the report section, which is E1, the superintendent's report. Yes, a few items tonight um, is uh, just for the board's information. Our current enrollment in the district, uh, 2,713 uh, total students, which is uh, up three from the prior week. Uh, the district is providing to our district staff um, our COVID vaccinations. Uh, to date, just over one third of our staff have participated in that, uh, in getting the vaccination, talking with county soups, uh, that, tends to be about on par to what, uh, what county uh, or other districts are seeing as well. So not uh, way above or behind uh, the, the average, so to speak. Surveillance testing is being provided to our, uh, to our uh, employees and students. Uh, each campus is, has an opportunity for testing once a, a per week. So depending on the campus, uh, we, we test uh, Monday through uh, Thursday, correct? And nothing on Fridays. Um, the district, just for information, is beginning to um, uh, ins installation of ionization units in each of our district's HVAC systems. Um, more uh, more uh, protocols in relation to trying to reduce uh, any type of potential uh, spread of virus on our campuses. Another project that the board might be interested in learning uh, that is starting to uh, take place here is that we are uh, readying our classrooms for complete switch outs of all of our smart boards with 75 inch integrated LED panels. Uh, more to the board on that information as Mr. McKenna and Mr. Martinez are heading that project up. And when we get those numbers squared away and can present that more, we'll obviously have that uh, for the board. And then finally, um, at, uh, not finally, but before I get to a, uh, a parent survey, uh, at each of your seats, you would assign a manila envelope uh, before you, it's related to superintendent evaluation. Please do uh, review that. And I look forward to uh, April on that issue. And then finally, um, just wanted to, pre to present to the board uh, a parent survey that was sent out related to COVID. And Ms. Brown, do you have it? Is it uh, on our agenda, right? So let me uh, bring that up. Let's see if we able to find that on our agenda. OK, 
Okay. Please, yeah. So I believe that presentation was at each of your desks, uh, each of your seats, and we're gonna throw it up here for Ms. Brown. All right, good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. And I just want to go over our parents who are maybe used to now about the response to COVID-19 that the district has. You know, we've been in at a year now, and we've learned so much from the close of schools back in March. And so this survey went out to each household. And so in, within our district, we have 1,619 homes. And so our responses, we have 581, which is about a 36% return rate. And so looking at that, of course, you would like to have 100% return rate. But when looking at surveys, and I did a little bit of research from the National Survey um, website, and it states that if, if a population our size, 20% would be considered a valid survey. Not a great. But a 36% is above that, so we're happy to see results. And so, of those um, 581 responses, 55% of those um, students are on on campus learning, and 45% are on full distance learning. So there's a variety in there. We'll go over that. And so, for on campus learning, the first question was How satisfied are you with the way learning is structured at your students' school right now? And so you'll see that 82% of those responses for on-campus learning were extremely satisfied or quite satisfied. 16 were somewhat, and 2% not satisfied. For a full distance learner, 67% were extremely or quite satisfied, 30% were somewhat, and 3% were not satisfied. So I think those numbers are speak to how hard our teachers and sites have been working with our students learning. For on campus learning results, how satisfied are you with the district safety measures, including temperature checks, social distancing, mask requirements, plexiglass barriers, and reduced class sizes? 94% are extremely satisfied or quite satisfied with the protocols we have in place right now on our campus to keep our students safe. 4% are, are somewhat satisfied, and 2% are not satisfied. When we look at our full distance learners with that question, with the question, how difficult or easy is it for your students to use Canvas? Canvas is our learning management system. That's where all the students' assignments are. They're on the, uh, they're called Canvas. The teachers use that to instruct the students at home. And that's where the students go in and submit their work and complete their assignment. 68% said it's not difficult. 26% said it's somewhat difficult. And 6% Say it is extremely difficult. And this is such an improvement because when we first started Canvas back in March, we all found it very difficult and we all had to learn together. Parents, teachers, students, we all learned together. And it is simply amazing to see how far we have come since March. When we look at our lessons that we submitted and we um, worked with our students on in March compared to now, it's amazing how good we've gotten at this learning. I'm very impressed with our staff on this effort. How concerned are you about your students' academic growth right now? And this comes um, for on campus, 46% are not concerned, 27% are somewhat concerned, and 27% are very concerned. And that and that's where we are too. We are also concerned about our students' growth. We we all know that as much as hard we have tried from March and school shut down to keep the pace and the rigor, it's very difficult. To teach when the students are not in front of us, when we cannot, you know, change our lessons and interact with them as we did in our work, as we did when they were you know, on campus before. For full distance learning, 55% are not concerned about academic growth, 19% are somewhat, and 26% are very concerned. The next question How concerned are you about your students' social emotional well being right now? On campus learning, 67% are not concerned, 19% are somewhat, and 14% are very concerned. The full distance learners, 66% are not concerned, 20% are somewhat, and 14% are very concerned. Social emotional learning has become very important as we have our students in the work with us remotely. So we've made great efforts in 
making sure that we're connecting with our students and keeping them connected to school and making sure that we're keeping their social emotional learning in place. The next one is how helpful has communication from your student school been this past school year? And 60, you know, 98 percent are either satisfied or somewhat satisfied with communication. Two percent are not satisfied. And for full distance learning, very similar. 97 percent very or somewhat satisfied, and three percent are not satisfied. We um, there's also uh, some areas where we can take parent comments, and one thread that was very popular was the um, use of parent square has been uh, very helpful in communicating with parents, and we found that too very valuable. How comfortable do you feel communicating with your students' school? 98% are very comfortable. You break that down a little more, 78% are very, and 19.4 are somewhat, and 2% are slightly uncomfortable, 0% are not comfortable. I think it's which is outstanding for full business learning. 98% uh, are very or somewhat comfortable, 1.6 slightly comfortable, and 0.4% not comfortable. So again, very strong communication between the school and the parent. I'm proud of that. Last question, how satisfied are you with the district response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been thus far? 86% are extremely or quite satisfied, 13 somewhat, and 1% not satisfied for on-campus learning. For full distance learning, 75% extremely or quite satisfied, 19% somewhat, 6% not satisfied. So I think that we have a lot to be proud of with this parent survey. I think we should fully be celebrating the successes and I appreciate the work that has gone in to make this successful. So, MOT to site principals, administrators, teachers, certificated staff, classified staff. It has been a true group effort and we're very proud of you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mullen. That, that would be the superintendent report for the month. Is there any board members that want to submit a report? Um, last meeting, we, it, the meeting has been asking for a town hall meeting. Uh, the previous meeting, there, we were, they were given, Mr. Mullen, you said, uh, between, we agreed seven to ten days, they would have, this meeting would have, would have a response. To this day, as it happened, I'm still receiving emails. I uh, community have contacted me asking me why have we still not had a town hall. Let me stop you right so, now. I'm sorry. Uh, me and the superintendent and the KSCA um, and there's been some people, some parents, um, students have, have had COVID. Other things have played a factor into the role of why we haven't had a town hall meeting. If we're all going to be present, you know. Um, and then if you're if someone's child is out sick, then we're not going to be able to make that happen. But me and the superintendent, him working with his KFCA staff has played a role. I'm sorry that we have not been able to communicate better to get that information out to all Mr. the Bowen, board members. Right there. We are present here at the moment, but, so why can't we get this meeting with our office? <laughs> I know I'm out of order, but they have to get into something to do with it. I'm sorry, can you repeat that? The FDA doesn't have anything to do with any of that. Okay. That's not a true statement. Mr. Coleman, I'm going to be with me. Is it a standard for them to have five more meetings like this at a open board meeting? I'm just curious because this is an open forum and a board meeting. It should be quite a conversation topic. We we will see we will we will schedule that we need to, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 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 the KFTA KFTA no, um, no. there, there was a community we, me and the superintendent had a conversation um and it was a misunderstanding 
uh, town hall meeting will be scheduled. If we want to schedule it right now, we can do that. Yeah, okay, we can schedule it. We can we can schedule that meeting because our, our normally our agendas are for the last 90 minutes, so we can schedule it for you guys tonight. It's up to the board. Um, go ahead and uh, when you want to do it. It's up to the board. Board, can we can we can do a town hall meeting anytime. Uh, I need three days to publish an agenda, so you can have it uh, starting as early as next. Uh, uh, we would need three days. Yeah, theoretically, I would. It would have to be sixteenth, uh, seventeenth, eighteenth. Looking at the calendar. Let's see here. Any of those days, sixteenth is there's a there's an LCAP on the sixteenth. There's an LCAP town hall Zoom at six p.m. So that might be. That's on Tuesday the sixteenth. So if we can steer clear of that, I'd appreciate that. But. Um, 17th is wide open in the evening as far as I can see. Um, yeah, and then Thursday, again, we have another evening um, and, and uh, there's an AVID evening thing and an LCAP evening thing. So 17th right now for next week. Um, and then the week after, if the board wants to consider that, that's up to, you know, up to you. What will be the agenda? What's that? What will be the agenda? Um, well, if we publish an agenda tomorrow, it would be hard to get. I'm assuming you're going to want to. Yeah, I'm assuming you're going to want to publicize the event so people will know it's going to happen. So you want to give it a couple of, give us a couple of days to send that out. But we could post it Monday too. You could legally, you could have it. You could you could do it Monday evening legally. Twenty second. Well, for for my calendar, the twenty second's fine. It's up to the board members if the twenty second works. I think it's better because when the, she works and there's nothing going on, I have three days for the agenda to go out. There's, okay, there's, 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 there's some other stuff. Okay, 22nd? 22nd. 22nd? 6 o'clock? Is that what I'm hearing? 22nd. Okay. All right. Want to get in there by twenty seconds? Okay, twenty seconds. Okay. Yeah, I think I make that work. Twenty seconds. Oh, I need to see my agenda. I think I have to. Yeah. Well, right now, check his calendar. Right now, before we can schedule it, and if it has to be adjusted from there. Okay. We'll schedule it the 22nd at 6 o'clock. Okay. Or can we do So he can tell us when it's when you're in the beginning. Majority already agreed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're, we. We're, I'm sorry. I'll just. Um, just to be fair to Miss Rio, um, Miss Rio is asking to give Mr. Tapia time to check his schedule. Um, can I get a motion for that? A motion to allow Mr. Tapia to check his schedule. There, can, can I get a motion? No. no motion. A motion to a motion to give Mr. Tapia time to check his schedule. 
and then to give that to us when he gets home, and then we can give that to Mr. Coleman, who can uh, put that on the. How about guys, if, if we can all agree that we're going to have a, a meeting sometime before the end of March, is that fair? And then I will send an email to the board tomorrow morning. You all will agree to check emails and send back dates that work for you and the date that works for everybody, I'll schedule and we'll announce. Does that work? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not okay with that because I, you know, I keep receiving emails, I keep receiving phone calls from the community and they're being persistent and we've already let them down once. Why are we going to do it again? That is not fair to make the time. We can set the schedule now. Okay. The, can I get a motion? A motion? For, motion for? A motion for? A motion for? Good one, second. Okay. I'll make that motion. A second. This is a motion. Motion for, for the meeting, meeting on, on the 22nd, 22nd at 6 p.m. Second. Okay, all Marios. Now, if you take a uh, vote, all Marios. Aye. Victoria, uh, Virginia Lawson. Aye. Palmer Mellon. Aye. Aye. Victoria Virginia. Jose Tapia. No. No. That's a 4 1 that the motion passes. We're going to schedule for the 22nd at 6 o'clock okay I'll, I'll create an agenda and get it out and we'll get it messaged yeah okay um we're into consent now sir so now we're in the consent section if you guys don't have anything um any problems with the consent section if we can um and we could approve that as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, F1 warrants and payroll. If I could get a motion for that one. You just need the consent. You can go items one through 13 and one, that's what consent, one through 13. Does anyone have anything one through 13 in the consent section that they need to have questions about? Motion. Okay. Well, can I get a motion to approve the consent? I'll make that a second. Uh, roll call vote on Mario. Aye. Virginia Lawson. Palmer Rowan, aye. Victoria Cornell, Jose. Aye. Okay, 5 0 passes. And the consent section is passed. Into business. That moves us into business and finance. Yes, Mr. Mullen, before the board tonight, um, the contract or agreement for the district to enter into the current purchasing cooperative. Remember that the district left uh, PENCO uh, uh, and is, is exiting PENCO. We've agreed to move in to the current purchasing cooperative. Obviously, it's more local. Uh, we are uh, entering into this uh, cooperative that currently holds Greenfield, uh, Wasco, Wasco Union High, Rio Bravo, Greeley. Um, and it would be us and the superintendent of schools. And so we asked the board to approve this uh, agreement effective July 1, 2021. Can I get a, a, a vote for that motion? First motion there, can I get another motion? Second by Jose, now vote by uh, Alma Rio. Aye. Virginia Lawson. Aye. Palmer Rowan. Aye. Victoria Cornell. Aye. Jose Tuffy. Aye. Okay, that's five zero. Oh. Yes. Next item, sir, is the agreement uh, sale of real property. Now it says vote, and I apologize. It's supposed to be a discussion item, so I, it, it, it doesn't need to be action tonight. But what the hope is is that uh, the board. Uh, will would um, absent hearing any negative, uh, the board would uh, have on the April agenda a voting item uh, moving along the sale of uh, part of land that the district owns behind Shirley Lane Elementary School. Um, with us tonight is uh, the uh, title director, of, <laughs> the general manager of the East Niles Water District, and he's going to address. He's been before the board. But this is a different board now. Um, before 
you know, there were members here that weren't here now, and now we have new members. And so, and about this time, um, the state and uh, is a little bit more serious and they've come along farther along the way. And so they're ready to actually get busy now. So it's better that he's here. So if you'll introduce yourself and kind of re-energize everybody about what the re what you're proposing, then that way the board can kind of give some direction about whether or not we're coming back next month or not. So, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, good evening, members of the board. My name is Tim Reese. I am the general manager for East Niles Community Services District, and we refer to ourselves as the water district. And I'm here tonight just to reiterate my district's interest in your property adjacent to the Ferry Lane Elementary School. And I don't know if you know the history or the background, but uh, you, you're not able to develop that property because of the state law that says there's so many feet from a rail line that you can't build any facilities. So it's been vacant all this time. So we're interested in developing a well, constructing a well there where the source came. Uh, this would serve the local community as well as uh, planned development just over here at Wind Bay and South Fairfax. So we did have an appraisal done, but it's kind of old now. It's about five years old. So if the district is interested, we can go ahead and look at revisiting that and see what the, the cost would be. But uh, my board is, very interested in purchasing this. The state did contact me uh, this week about funding for uh, putting in new distribution mains in this area, South Hallway and Hall Road, and Cross View Catch Highway. And it would also include the well and the tank I just mentioned. So my board though is concerned that the state's dragging the fee. So we're interested in just making the purchase now and then hopefully get reimbursed from the state later. So I know this has gone on for quite a long time. But, uh, my board's now interested in moving forward. So what we would do then, if the board uh, would want to, we could look at revisiting the appraisal, then come back to the superintendent to give you that information, and then we would proceed. If, if we agree to, we can have an agreement to uh, purchase the property, and we'll go ahead and take care of all the fees and legal descriptions and everything else that's required for the purchase. And if you'll remind, you know, the land behind Shirley Lane is roughly, I want to remember, three and a half, four acres, maybe five. Right. You're not proposing buying all of that. Right? No, it's we're only about one and a half acres. acres. Yeah. Uh, I have had some people contact me interested in the property too for development. Right. Uh, they have to come to me because I have to give a little survey. So <laughs> I can hold up things, you know. No, I'm going to do that. But, anyways, <laughs> uh, uh, we are interested in, uh, yeah. What will happen to the remaining uh, land that you own uh, remains to be seen, but I'm sure it's only probably one of the house. Well, you. you are correct. The district would, is not able to build a, and and put uh, anything that has to do with students on that on that acreage because of the proximity to the railroad spur. Um, and we do from time to time have to maintain clean up. We get complaints from the ground when the air. Uh, when the dust gets going really good, we're responsible. People come and dump illegally on there. We're responsible to remove it. So there is an ongoing maintenance to that property. Um, it's really whether or not uh, with the board, if they're interested in, in you know, uh, selling about eight, one and a half acres on that, we'll know who the owner is forever and a day. So you know that we'll be taken care of. Um, but other than that, it's really up to the board to determine if you want to sell that property or for us to continue to maintain the entire property as it is right now. We have no call on the property. It's It was just purchased as that was what was purchased to, to get the Shirley Lane campus land. Right? Last so, time there was another person uh, interested in that land. Can we make sure that they no longer have an interest in any part of buying that? The district hasn't been approached from anyone um, interested in, in, in proposing purchase of that land since Tim originally came to the board um, all those years back. Prior to that, there was uh, one person back in the days when everybody was developing everything in the world. Um, that was back in what, 08, I think it was, or maybe 06 when everybody was, yeah. Um, but it hasn't been since. So just to let you know, that's not, I think what you're confusing is, is when the when the saddle shop was, was right. being, it, somebody wanted to try to, have us donate the land to move the, the 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 building and let that happen, and that never happened. They don't they bulldoze the, the house, and so that's no longer viable. 
So anyway, I know this is just for information. Uh, your superintendent would let me know what so it's really up to the board. Um, I just it's a discussion. So I guess am I bringing back an item for the board to vote on? Is it is it am, is anybody giving me the heck no? I'm not interested in even talking about it again. Or are we interested enough to bring it back um, as a vote so that we can move the project forward? I have a question. I have drunk the water across the street in the Fairfax area. It was awful. So much that the people would boil it sometimes before they would cook. Uh, are you going to do anything with the well over there? Is the well st still in the same water vein, or are you uh, going to treat it? Or I, I, so I think you're referring to the Victory Mutual Water Company. Whatever they had there. So uh, actually, the state wants us to take over their system and put in new water mains. And yeah, I don't know uh, how deep their wells are. Their wells are shallow. They may be. Um, that can lead to nitrate issues and some other issues. I, I don't know the, all the water quality characteristics of their wells, but our wells typically are are very deep. We'll probably go about twelve hundred feet. And, Pump a thousand to fifteen hundred gallons per minute because you know we're we're serving a large municipal area. Um, so in regards to the water quality, yeah, we have to meet the standards. Now, some of you may have seen our notices going out about one, two, three PCP, and I just want to let you know that we've tested all of our wells. There is this one well that has detected that, but lately we've been testing it and it's been non-detect. But the fact that we did detect it one time or a few times, we have to inform everybody. More than likely, it's not in the water, but the fact that we detect that one time, we still need to let everybody know. So currently we do have a um, treatment plant uh, under construction to resolve that issue. And if there's any other issues with the groundwater here, uh, if there's arsenic in here, the state will fund for arsenic treatment as well. So whatever contaminant that we encounter that's uh, uh, above the maximum contaminant level, uh, We'll address that and get funding for it. Do you, have, do you have plans on going south on Fairfax? Yes. How far down? Uh, Tomorrow Road, uh, the Oasis uh, House Association, whatever, and all the way like near, almost near Sterling Road, mm -hmm. going that way. Yeah, we're looking at also uh, putting in new. And like going west towards Sterling? Uh, yeah, of course, there's a, they spread all the upland. We can't go that far, but. Uh, the farthest we could go is Sterling. Uh, I know I have an employee who lives on Sterling anymore, so she's very interested in connecting. But until the, the line is constructed, uh, there's only uh, certain uh, water systems that can be part of the, the project mm -hmm. right now. So I, I can just tell you, Victory Mutual is one of them, the Oasis, there's a San Joaquin the State's Mutual Water Company, there's uh, Country Estates. Uh, also, and then um, there's a small one over here, uh, East Wilson Road, just a few homes, but we would be putting in new names in that area as well. All right. Thank you. Well, we'll, re we'll be receiving an updated appraisal and all that, right? If that's what you want to do, yeah. If we're going to expend, we're gonna expend if he's going to expend the energy and the money and some funds, I just want to make sure that we're, if it comes to the board and it's good to go, that it's going to be considered and we're interested at least considering it. So. so will we need it to go for a bid on that? Will we need to have a bid? No. No. No, just to let you know, so we are a special district, so we're prohibited from uh, providing a gift of public funds. So in other words, if you wanted you know, pie in the sky type money, we couldn't do that. We have to go through appraisal and give you what- okay. Same for us, we yeah, can't pay over same. appraisal, so. Um, so I'm hearing that we can, we should bring it back for April. Mr. Tuppy, yeah. okay? Yeah, it's the land right behind Shirley Lane. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, okay. Okay, so it looks like we'll be back in April 
And then you and I, before that time, we need to do some business. Okay. Okay. Very good, sir. Thank you. Okay. Are we okay with the interim, sir? So yes. Jonathan. So uh, we're now going to move into the second interim budget. Mr. Hang on uh, here. Are you a panelist? I am. So you should be able to do that now. Are you able to do it? I am. All right. Try and keep it short and quick. Um, so the second interim is the second of our uh, mid-year financial reviews for required to do them for Ed Code. Um, and when we do these financial reviews, we take a look at the district's current fiscal year uh, health as well as the two following years. Uh, and we use actual from January 31st to do these projections. Um, the board is required to take action on this report and the chairman committee to the county office of education to review it. I do want to talk about the state budget for a hot second. Um, what happens at that level trickles down to what happens here at the school level. Um, state revenue, the state budget is doing fantastic. Uh, the revenues are far exceeding all projections in the current budget, uh, which was revised upward in January. Um, so the state's doing great, the deferrals are still left in the legislature, uh, meaning that even though the state's doing great, we are still set to not receive our monthly apportionment from February to June. So again, though the state's doing great, but they're still not going to be receiving the money that we are owed for those months. Um, and the reason for those are, are the state's imbalancing their golden stimulus, the reopening grants, vaccination priority, things like that. Um, so that's just a quick quick update of what's happening with the state. And since first interim, again, we've now reopened our campuses for uh, a &P and instruction. We reopened our kiddos back on in February. We also hired two additional teachers. We knew that, that by bringing the kiddos back on campus, we were going to battle classroom shortages uh, for certificated staff. So we brought them on to aid with that. We also received uh, a cafeteria allocation from the state um, back in March of 2020. COVID happened originally, and then we ended up getting the first care package. But we just now received a one time payment, and this was aimed at school nutrition to help us through this year. Um, so that, that was very much welcome. And uh, now we've received preliminary allocations for the seven stimulus package that President Trump signed in just before he left office in December. So just covering unrestricted revenues, again, through all of these pages, you're, you're going to be looking at the unrestricted side of the budget because that's the true indicator of fiscal health for our district. Now, unrestricted revenues overall uh, have changed downward by $26,000. P1 attendance uh, certified in, in our indicator percentage dropped by about half a percent, just resulting in a $46,000 decrease. Um, other state revenue decreased by about $12,000. There's a, an assessment apportionment that the state is not going to be funding this year for the other that we adjusted. Other local revenue has been upwardly adjusted by $30,000 uh, because of our interest rate increase. Um, we've gone in and updated those. And so uh, we're each making more interest on the tax that we have in the bank. So it's been upwardly adjusted by 30 grand. Now, looking at our, at our expenditures, you'll see that we've made uh, downward adjustments to the salaries uh, for those certificate and classified uh, budgets. That's because uh, you know, we were on full distance learning. We had to reduce need for any additional subs or supplemental pay. Um, and so it's just been downwardly adjusted for those. You will see a larger increase in our employee benefits of $1.3 million. And that's related to uh, an OCUP trust contribution. And that is a big deal, but I will touch on that on the slide just in a moment. Now, back to books and supplies, that budget has decreased by 183,000. That's due to uh, the decreased uh, budget for fuel, bus repairs, things that we're now seeing when, when we're, we didn't have kiddos on campus uh, during the, the December, January months. We've also had reduced materials and supplies for our classroom budgets. 
um, just because we've been able to utilize an offset with the one time COVID money that we have. Um, you see services and capital outlay are increasing though, and that's primarily uh, due to the two portables that we've now uh, constructed or in the progress of constructing. One at Zephyr Lane, uh, that's just one and is operational, and now one storage portable here in the MOT yard. Again, here to cover these type of additional storage needs to keep everything uh, for uh, the staff. So I did mention that OPEB trust. And that, that's a really big deal with uh, what's included in this budget. So we made promises to our employees that if they give us 15 years of service uh, and they decide to retire between ages 55 and 65, that we will cover their health and welfare benefits. And uh, what this budget includes is a one-time payment to fully fund our OPEP trust. And what our OPEP trust is intended to do is cover the cost of all these retiree benefits, all these promises that we've made, and take all those expenses from the general fund and just have it that trust in for it to really free those dollars up. Um, and so by doing this, we be one of just a handful of districts in the entire state that can claim they're fully funded. Like this would be an elite level. It's a very big deal, something we can really uh, hang our hat on. That. That's something we accomplished. Um, it really affirms our, our, our uh, passion and uh, uh, strong fiscal policies uh, because we're using one time money to create real ongoing savings for years. Every year, we'd be saving about $400,000 by fully funding OPEP this year. This one-time payment would pay for itself in just four years, and in over 10 years, we're looking at having a $2.5 million savings, that's real savings, budgetary savings that we have to be able to build up to the district. So this is a really, really big deal. Um, and, and at the end of the day, it assures our employees that we're gonna be able to fulfill our promises. We could have some crazy money spending tyrant coming and run the district into the ground, but our employees would know they're taking care of the promises that we made. We're still going to do. Just so we're clear, that's not me, right? No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Just want to make sure that's yeah. not me. Here we have. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so this is just a <laughs> this is just a chart showing when the yellow bar is <laughs> showing uh, the cost, the one-time cost, and you'll see the, the increase in the green bar over four years. We eclipse that. That one time cost in over the 10 years would ultimately have two and a half million dollars in budget savings. So back, back to our budget. Uh, there's been two, two adjustments to our transfer down contributions. This transfer out is 100 percent to our nutrition fund. Uh, first of all, we said that and projected that the cafeteria fund would need about six hundred fifty-four thousand dollars to continue operating uh, uh, their, their normal operations just because of the decrease in participation. 17. Well, now I mentioned we got the one, the, the, the nice welcome gift from the gift, but uh, allocation from uh, the state. Uh, now it's about $175,000, and that's really helped to offset uh, that $654,000. In addition, we've uh, now opened up on uh, the AMPM starting in February, so our participation rates have increased and helped to offset that. But we're still anticipating that the cafeteria fund is going to be. 382. So it's an improvement of 270 grand, but it's still showing that the cafeteria fund is going to need support. Um, contributions, uh, those, those are contributions from the general fund to our restricted programs. And those have also decreased just like, like the unrestricted side, our salaries and benefits, things like that for our supplemental and substitute as well as full distance learning. We did not extend those funds so that it can be reduced. Um, same thing for the, the classroom supplies and things like that. So, uh, that adjustment's been made to contributions. So looking at the ending fund balance, uh, I do want to touch that this is budget. This is not cash. This is just our budget, but we're projecting an increase in ending fund balance of $800,000. Uh, this would bring our unrestricted reserve percentage to 15.88. But again, this is not cash. This is budget, because I mentioned earlier, the state's going to be withholding cash to the tune of about $7.5 million this year. We're going to have to manage you know, we've got a good budget, but we need to manage the cash. So that's just one thing I wanted to just say. Um, so when you look at our multi-years, um, these include factors. If you look at the changes in revenue, changes in expenditures, um, all of the factors that we've had, taking in uh, the, the reduction plan items, and then all the items that were rescinded, everything's all been included in these multi-year projections. So our revenues is what this year shows. We've got a, we're showing about a two and a half uh, percent increase to revenues uh, over the next year, and about 1.7 percent from that debt 
second year to the third year. So revenue is trending upward. Now, when we look at our expenditures, I just want to draw your eyes to the bottom. You'll see that, that we're increasing by about half a percent this next year, but increasing 9.36% that second year. And the, the reason for that is that the 2021, 22 years when all of that, that COVID one-time funding that we've been provided, that's when it ends. So a lot of all those expenditures that we've been you know, able to utilize and, and leverage there, those come back to our unrestricted budget. And that's why we're seeing the 9% increase there. So in terms of any fund balance, you'll see we've got both the large increase in the current year, large increase in the second year, but then in the third year, when all of the expenditures come back, you see we've actually got an increase in the fund balance there. Uh, there is one large textbook adoption, $500,000 that's happening in that year, which is pretty negative. Um, otherwise, we're essentially looking at a balanced budget years three, four, and five. So again, bringing us to cash flow, now that we've had our, our, our budget revised and we provide the cash management strategies we're looking for this year, I'm now anticipating that our annual cash balance in June is going to be $258,000. Um, again, we'll need to delay some of our planned expenditure things, you know, all under deferred maintenance, less purchases, that OPEP payment that I mentioned. Again, it's all budgeted in the current year, but the cash will not be leaving until next year. Um, again, I mentioned that the deferrals have already started in February. We've already been uh, missing out on a large chunk of our normal money and that's going to continue until we know. Uh, repayment for that is going to start happening in July, last year, and then this year. Um, again, we utilize interfund borrowing. I've uh, identified about $750,000 in other funds that we'll be able to borrow uh, even if needed. Um, at this time, we may not need to utilize the trans, but it's something we still need to keep on the table with that same thing. So we don't know what the future holds, but it's always great to have that safeguard. And again, if you don't need to use it, you don't get charged with any. There's no fees for, for not using Looking ahead, just going to continue to monitor cash flow. So that's going to be a big deal. Uh, the governor is going to be releasing a revised budget in May, so we'll see what that holds. Um, and again, I'm, I'm currently starting to work on the, the district's next year budget, the 21-22, and that's going to be brought to the board in June uh, for review and approval. So at this time, I'd recommend the second interim uh, be approved with a positive certification meaning that we can meet our obligations for the current and future. That's my presentation. I'll go over there. Any questions? Can I get a, a motion to approve this section? Real quick, if it's okay, I just want to echo the fact that John, uh, Jonathan, um, fully funding OPEB is, is a big thing. I, you said it, and I'm going to say it. Um, I started, when I first came here, I was the assistant to the business, and I started uh, trying to fund OPEB. And we made some progress toward it. Being able to complete that, uh, as you said, I think I think we're one of two districts in the county and very elite in the state. That and that's a big thing because it affects our credit rating uh, significantly. And, and so, uh, and you're right, it does bring back cash over the long term to the operating fund. So, I just want to say congratulations and, and thank you for making that a priority um, in the work you do. So thank you. Okay, can I get First and a second. Second. Is that Tapia? Yes. I'll take it. Alma Rios. Aye. Virginia Lawson. Aye. Palmer Mullen. Aye. Victoria Cornell. Aye. Jose Tapia. That's a private mm -hmm. The second interim passed. Now we will move into educational services yes. where we have a single plan for student achievement. Yes, Mr. Mullen, over the next couple of months to, uh, to this, this meeting and next, um, each of our sites is going to present to the board. Uh, we call it, uh, you know, boastfully being proud of what you do and come and, come and you know, let your, let your light shine type of thing. So every year the board has to approve any revisions uh, to a single plan for student achievement. And we kind of wrap that up in each, in each site kind of uh, presenting to the board. Uh, what they're most proud of and the things that they've implemented and, and continuing to do at their sites for the students. So tonight we're going to highlight Fairfax Junior High and Zephyr Lane. Each of these presentations about 20 minutes. Do we need to take a quick break or do we want to motor through? All right. If that's okay, then um, if it's okay, I'll ask uh, Junior High 
Wendy? And let me get to. Hello. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for bringing us back on October 28th, even though we were only there for about three and a half weeks. Um, and then back again on February 9th. Our students are so happy to be back at school. We still have about 40% on distance learning. Um, our single plan for student achievement has to be done every year. We're looking at our goals and action steps for each year. I am just with the LCAP. Um, and it, there are line items in it where we have to have those line items in there because it's federal money and we have to show how we're spending federal money. But we also add additional line items to that plan because we want to make sure we're reevaluating every year based on parent surveys, student surveys, staff surveys, what we're doing and that we're meeting the needs of our students and families. So we prepared a video. Actually, Mr. Garcia, one of our fabulous staff members, helped us put this together. And instead of boring me with a long PowerPoint and more talking, I want to talk to you. So really quick, the single plan for student achievement has five goals, and under those goals, there are multiple action steps, which you can read in the document. It's a very long document. The goals are to fully implement the Common Core standards in reading and language arts and make sure our, our students are college and career ready, as well as to fully implement the Common Core standards in math to make sure our students are college and career ready. The third goal is English learners and to make sure that English learners are continuing to progress each year in their levels. The fourth goal is to make sure that we are engaged with parents. So we're looking at that percentage rate every year to continue to increase parent engagement. Tonight, you'll see a video on a virtual parent training that we have, which is beautiful and amazing. You're going to see the English version, but part of it was also done in Spanish. Um, and then goal five is to increase the level of school um, student connectedness to the school, which is really, really important. In order for students to learn, they need to be connected to the school. They need to be valued and they need to feel like they're a part of the school. So please enjoy this video. Oh, you're kidding me. So what we'll do is we'll do some reading and we'll kind of bounce back and forth to the notes as we read. Okay, and I have Natalie first, if you can take the first two slides. There's gonna be some big words today because there's gonna be some scientific words. Do your best to say them and I may interrupt you here and there just to make sure we're pronouncing it correctly. Okay, Natalie. Lacey and Rachel study chemistry, psychology, anatomy, and physiology, and work in hospitals, nursing homes, doctors, offices, and government health departments. All right, so I just put R in. You hear that a lot. It's going to come up a lot today. That's a registered nurse. And by the way, sorry, thank you for the Zoom being the way. Um, we have some teachers here, some of my uh, close friends here, Ms. Boschini and Mr. Keeley. Um, both of their wives are nurses. In fact, uh, Mr. Boschini's wife is the head of nursing at CSUB. She has her doctorate. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty uh, high-level position. But I was talking to Mr. Keeley, and he was talking about there are a lot of different things you can do with a nursing degree. It's not just you know, taking care of patients at the at the bedside. So I just want you to keep that in mind as we continue. All right, so this is all I have so far because we'll get into the details of this in a few minutes. Can you guys see this okay? That's your LPAC score? And if you notice, you have, remember, you needed a four overall. The top LPAC score is your overall score. And then they break the four subtests into pairs. So you get a score for your listening and speaking, which is the next set of scores you see. And you get a score for reading and writing. Okay? 
remember that overall score is an average of your listening, speaking, reading, and writing. There are, again, the reading strategy. Well, I want you to promise me, especially on your cell phone, and actually on any time you have a reading um, test, and they're asking you to read um, a text, which means a paragraph or an essay or some sort of a short story. I want you to do this first. I want you to look at number two and I want you to read the question first. Read the question first before you even begin to start reading the text. Okay? Read the question first before you start reading the paragraph or the short story. Because what that's going to do, my sweetheart, is it's going to guide your reading. It's going to let you know what the important parts of the paragraph are. Okay? So always, 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 always read the question first. And then you're going to highlight and underline those important words in the question that you're going to be looking for, right, as you're reading. Dr. Shore, your experience at the school and applying the college and picking your name and deciding what you want to do with life. I'm sure people have told you to make sure you have something to hold back on. Make sure you have something to hold back on. But I didn't understand that concept. Having something to hold back on. If I'm going to fall, Do you, you guys agree with that? You guys think we have the talent is something that we can succeed? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Not. We all do. Okay. You might not know, you know, yet what your dreams are or what you want to study, you know, in college or what you want to do professionally. Um, but you, you all have the talent to succeed. Even right now, if you're, you know, the first you're struggling with this time, you can do this learning or partial, partial learning on campus, you know. You all have the ability to be in your classes. You know, just gotta put some time and effort in there. Um, and um, okay, what stood out to you? Right before I see my questions, um, maybe some other, you know, one, one statement that you made really stood out. Uh, I had uh, um, him saying how he doesn't want to go back to the chaos. Back. He wants to go to work because he has not to see what he's falling out. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, right. Definitely interesting. All right, so before we talk about the actual article, we're going to go over the two words that are the focus words for this article. So the word invade. I'm not going to tell you what the word invade means. I'm going to give you some examples of the word invade being used. And then I will ask someone to tell me what they think the word invade means. So here's my example. When a boxer is in the ring and they have their opponent, they are trying to invade punches from the other fighter. Okay, so the boxer, that boxer is trying to evade punches from the other boxer. Here's another example. Uh, like in the Air Force, the fighter jets. When they're training, the fighter jets are trying to evade, uh, like if there's missiles coming towards them, they're trying to evade the missiles. But someone tell me, what God? What's the word for what God? Dodge. What's another word you can use? Eighty-five dollars for ten hours. Not ten hours of work. Where do you find the working there? 
One program that we use is called the Renaissance. Through Renaissance, the students log into their account and they are then able to access Accelerated Reader. Accelerated Reader is really important because the student reads a book and then they're able to take a comprehension test and earn points. A lot of teacher give, teachers give prizes for points. Some teachers require so many points for grades through Accelerated Reader. And it's a good way for us to keep track of students reading. Um, when you get into it, you just search your title, take quiz, and it's usually anywhere from 10 to 20 questions depending on the level of the book. Another part of Renaissance that we use is Star Map and Star Reading. Students take a Star Reading test to assess their reading level and their math level. At the junior high, we start as you every quarter to, to progress their growth in math and start reading. Sora is our online library for students to use. They just click on the Sora app on their iPad, go to explore, and they can explore all the many different titles we have available, which is a little over a thousand or so. Um, they can just go by genre, uh, the new ebook edition, we have audiobooks, the popular. Great reads, and what they do when you find a book, you're going to click on it and you click borrow, and it downloads right into their iPad. They can read it anytime they want. They have the book for two weeks. Um, it's really easy for them to use. They just click and their iPad to, for the pages to turn, and then they're able to read it. When students are done reading the book, they can just click back to the very first page to find the X that says close at the top left hand corner. And then they press borrowed and return and return the book to somebody else can check it out. Very simple. Another app we have for our students to check out books is called Epic. Um, through Epic, the teacher needs to set up the student's account. So as you can see, there's many books for the students to explore. And once they get a book, they just click on it and it opens right there on the iPad. You click the screen to turn the pages. It also reads out loud to you. And um, you can even keep it in your own little personal library as well. Very easy app to use. Only downfall is they have to use it during school hours.
To purchase prizes from the PBIS award store, go to Clever. You're going to select store, and then you're going to select Falcon store. There you can see all the prizes that you can purchase with your points. Some of the items that you can purchase with your PBIS reward points include free assignment pass, a mystery PBIS item, or you can enter a raffle to win a lunch gift card. By the way, just so you're aware, uh, junior high seems to have uh, caught on to how to do all that right. They've now two months in a row taken home the attendance trophy. So whatever you're doing there, uh, good job. All right. So up next is Zephyr Lane. <clears throat> Okay. Good evening. I'd like to thank the board and uh, Mrs. Brown, Mr. Cohen, for allowing us to, uh, well, me on behalf of Zephyr Lane, showcase some of the wonderful and awesome things we're doing now uh, over at Zephyr Lane. So, uh, home of the mighty hurricanes. So here we go. Um, just a quick peek at the overview of the presentation. Three important stakeholder groups that I'd like to recognize are the students, parents, and staff. I call them uh, the heartbeat of Zephyr Lane. I like to use that uh, terminology there because You'll see throughout this presentation that it's really a recurring theme um, where we're recognizing the students, the parents, and the staff. And uh, we're, we're a team at Zephyr Lane. And, and again, you'll see that throughout this presentation. And I really wanted to take a moment to really highlight that. Other things you'll see are student uh, incentives and acknowledgement, um, keeping staff morale up, our interventions and programs, family and community engagement, which is still very huge, uh, our vision and goal, and then of course, to, to end it out our next steps. Student uh, incentives and acknowledgement, every Friday, uh, this started late last year when we first uh, went into full distance learning, we posted a virtual rally where we recognize our students for their hard work and efforts. This rally is pre-recorded and it's uh, posted to parents who are every Friday morning. Students are recognized for things such as their attendance, building reading skills, strong participation, and overall effort. And then Friday afternoon, what we like to call the prize control goes out and delivers the prizes to the winners' front doors. You can see here we have a few pictures of some of our winners. Um, this has really caught fire in a good way. Um, you know, Friday mornings when I post to parents' work, at times I get busy. And when it's not up at a certain time, I'm getting text messages, I'm getting emails. Uh, teachers and, and students alike would love to see this. Um, the prize control, I don't always get to go because I'm busy in the office, but my prize control members let me know that when they pull up, students are looking out the window and, and they're certainly excited for us to come and deliver those prizes. And 
I just think it's imperative. It's extremely important to, even at a distance, for, for some of our students still with the distance learning, to continue to recognize them. And so now we give them awards for AM, PM, uh, as well as our full distance learners. So uh, just something uh, that's really, like I said, caught fire in a good way. We're really proud of it. Uh, students, parents, staff alike, really care for us. All right, next I'm going to discuss staff morale. Uh, I put a quote there, morale is the greatest single factor in successful wars. And I like that quote, and I especially like that word wars, because since we've been in this pandemic, that's what we've been in. We've been in a war. We've been in a battle with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so whenever you're in a war, you're going to have battles, and there's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be highs and lows. And so, you know, your soldiers, in this case, my educators, so to speak, we have to go to battle. Right, and and we want to win that war, which is really winning that educational battle. And so, you know, in order to do that, you got to keep your staff happy. And so, staff morale is huge for us. I put here, we appreciate our staff at Zephyr Lane, and really take every opportunity to acknowledge their hard work, dedication, and efforts. We do that by, as you can see, having Jersey days where teachers can participate along with the students, uh, dress up days. Uh, more recently, uh, thanks to our um, Zephyr Lane Booster Club, we have the Rolling Beat Mart came out. And so teachers were able to enjoy some snacks. They were able to indulge in some uh, some drinks, some coffees, and, and the like. And so it was a really good time. Um, and again, you got to keep your staff happy. You want to keep that positive energy and that good vibes flowing. And so, um, you know, I I love my staff. Zephyr Land, we're a family, and so they deserve this so much more. Talking about uh, interventions and programs, we have our STEM program, which our our STEM teacher Lucy Wells has done a, a well of a job in uh, making an A and B schedule and getting our A and P in their, their time, as well as our full distance learners. Zoom, which we're obviously all uh, acquainted with now. Um, Canvas, as, as Mrs. Brown alluded to earlier, we're all really better with Canvas. What I like about Canvas is it continues to be a learning platform even with our on-campus students. Um, Reflex now, we're really practicing that, that accuracy and fluency with math skills. Nearpod, uh, Accelerator Reader, our students love, they're able to read books and then and then take um, those tests and be recognized for their accomplishments. And then two big ones for me are iReady and Lexia, and I'll take a deep dive into those a little bit later in the presentation. Something we're extremely proud of was our, was our reading lab. And so I'll quickly go through that. The reading lab is a very inviting place where our students come for reading support. Uh, after assessing our students, we we find specific skills that students are struggling with, and then we target those with strategies that build their phonics knowledge as well as their confidence as a reader. Uh, this year, we've been working with students through Zoom and in person, AM and PM groups. Uh, our reading specialist, Mrs. Brown, worked really hard at that. And so we're proud of our reading lab, um, and we just continue to look forward to supporting our students by helping them grow as readers and developing a lifelong love for literacy. I embedded a short video here. This is pre COVID. Um, I, think it's, I think it's good. It's, uh, it's a permission. Okay. We'll move it, it on. I can, I'll send it to the board. Okay, perfect. And it's just a uh, pre COVID uh, set, uh, Channel 23 news came out and it did a good deal on, on our reading. It really painted a picture of you know, how important we, we take reading on our school site. Uh, next is family and community engagement. I have a, a lengthy uh, quote here, but I want to read it. No matter how skilled professionals are, nor how loving families are, each cannot achieve alone, but the parties working hand in hand can accomplish together. And so again, going back to that, that team-driven uh, philosophy we have, we really, really uh, love our families and community, and uh, so critical that even during the pandemic, that we continue to work with them, provide for our students and children, um, and provide them with the best opportunity to succeed. Here at the bottom, I'd like to go well, over the next couple of slides. I'd like to, um, highlight some of the things we're doing in December. We have a hot chocolate and candy cane drive through uh, We really Sorry. Yeah, we really miss our students and really we're looking for a creative and fun way to share the holiday season with them. Uh, so we decided to host some hot chocolate and candy cane drive through And uh, we had roughly 450 parents come and take part in the fun. And it really was a, a good time and kind of put us on a nice trajectory going into the holiday break. Uh, continuing with the family and community engagement in the month of October, we opened up what we called our uh, Zephyr Lane Pumpkin Patch. Uh, families were provided with materials to create their own pumpkin and then hang it on the fence. And in the picture on the right, you can kind of see it through there. Um, the parents came in, they were able to get the materials and then come. And then, of course, we followed that fun event up with a real life pumpkin that read to our kindergartners. 
That was a I, I take that personally. <laughs> uh, in the month of well, 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 well. I'm wearing my pumpkin, man. Yeah. Yeah. In the month of December, uh, we did something similar. We launched our Zephyr Lane tree farm. Uh, again, families were provided with materials to create ornaments and hang them on the trees, uh, which was our fence. Um, our families got very creative for this event, and, and they really enjoyed it very much. So again, just that, that family and community engagement, trying to be as creative as we can in, in keeping that, uh, even though during this specific time, we were in so this environment. So with anything, you have to have a vision and a goal. Uh, you know, if you want to succeed at least. And so, you know, the vision is that families and educators continue uh, continuing to work together in the best interest of the student. And, and that means so much, always keeping the student's interest at the forefront, no matter what. Um, and then, of course, we want to have an end goal. And, and for us, our goal is continuous, to continue to give the student every opportunity to be successful by supporting them socially, emotionally, and academically. And I love this quote here. It says that no school can work well for children if parents and teachers, and really that's all staff, do not act in partnership on behalf of the child's best interest. Again, so you see, you see a theme there, child's best interest, interest of the student. It always has to come back to that. And so to, to close out, I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention that there has to be some next steps here. I mean, we recognize and understand that due to the pandemic, and how it has affected the educational process, there's going to be a considerable amount of learning loss for our students, and it's just complete transparency. Uh, but the consequential and more important question is what are we going to do in the immediate future to, to combat and fight this issue? Well, from day one, we've been calling families from the office, uh, whether it's absences, academics, or COVID related issues, we're really drilling down to figure out what those issues are. Home visits are done daily, whether again, it's absences, academics, delivery of curriculum. Way early in the year, there were a lot of iPad issues, so we were out there, uh, you know, being tech guys, so to speak. Um, the district, this is more of a district level, but again, we're proud that we provided internet hotspots for all our families without internet. And then more recently, we hired more teachers to offset our impact with the distance learning classes, and that was done when we came back on the campus. Uh, made the numbers go up uh, a little bit. And then, sorry, I'm just going to get back. Not me, you right. ghost. Um, and then, you know, moving forward, as I mentioned, continuing to target and group students based on their reading needs. Um, our, our STEM teacher providing math tutoring to hone in on those math skills. Um, our expanded learning programs providing academic tutoring. That looks a little bit different with the district, uh, sorry, different around the district. But at our site, our ACES does a really good job of, of helping out with that. Um, I talked earlier about Alexia and I Ready. I absolutely love these programs and, and we're really going to capitalize on them going forward. What I love about these programs is it's differentiated instruction and it's going to meet each student's individual needs. For these programs to start, they take what's called a diagnostic test and it places them and it really drills down on what they're missing. And so when we're able to give our students that, they're able to access it at school and at home. I feel like it's, it's wonderful because it can really start to close those achievement gaps. Uh, sometimes when you're a teacher and you have 25, 30 students, it's hard to get to every student. Well, these programs do that in a certain manner. And so we're going to take a deep dive into those. Um, again, more recently, the hiring uh, additional aides to assist with our LPAC testing, which has been a great, smooth testing process, probably about 75% done with that. Um, and then, of course, uh, lastly, state testing is coming up. And so we're going to provide our teachers tools and provide some practice training and tests for our students. So with but this year the state testing, those scores will not count, right? They're not gonna count the they score. Count. Count. They will count them this year. As of right now, the 2021 scores will be compared to the 2019 test scores. Yeah, and so we have those and we also have our continuing uh, you know, we from those high ready and Alexia and AR our SAR testing and SAR map, we have different means to calculate uh, just how the students are doing. And that wraps it up. Any questions? Good job. <laughs> All right. Thank you guys. Very good. Okay. With that, that um, is our um, educational services. We will move um, the H2 expanded learning draft to some program. We'll move that discussion to our next month's agenda, um, if that's okay with the board.
I'm just, uh, I'll take a motion for this is a discussion item. Mm -hmm. You can just table here. Second. Second. Okay. Can I get a, a vote? All Maria. Virginia Lawson. Aye. Formal. Aye. Victoria Cornell. Aye. Jose. Aye. We stop you. That's a 5 0. We'll bring that back, that discussion out of back this month. And if, that's, if we have no other business, then this meeting will be adjourned at 7 59. Yep. 7 59, the meeting has been adjourned. Is there signatures before the board members leave? I can't hear anybody. Uh, 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 oh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Who's got? I thought, yeah, we had 759. Who's the vote? Who's the motion in second? Uh, <laughs> oh, Jose. Yeah. Um, can I get a vote? All on my real. Great. Virginia Lawson. All of them. Aye. Aye. Victoria. Jose. Aye. Right on. Thank you. Signatures? 759 still. Yep. Yeah.